book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Familiar words, but appropriate words, testify of the great coming and the great joy of our God. Reading verses 1 through 11. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended and her iniquity is pardoned and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field, the grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. One of the great markers and marvels fact that the scripture was written by God and not people is that it accurately speaks to the complexity of the human condition in every stage and aspect of life in every time. Oh, it certainly has historical context, but it is not dated as it were. The prophet Isaiah is here giving the word of the Lord to God's people about God's deliverance from a future exile, and indeed all future strife in the big picture of it. How can words written nearly 3,000 years ago to a small Near Eastern people group be so powerful and so applicable in 2020 America? Because the Eternal Father has written it to His eternal children. The Eternal Father has written these things in time, in context, but with application to everyone who calls upon His name and knows His glory and knows His love in every situation throughout the centuries. In relation to the coming of Christ, we understand that God, Christ, is the ultimate comfort. And that comfort is fulfilled in Him even from these words. Advent meditation that we've been thinking on these last several weeks require us to recognize the failures and disappointments of the present, the failures and disappointments of humanity, the failures and disappointments of life as it ebbs and flows and moves and waxes and wanes, the failures and disappointments of the reality of mortality and then take our gaze and our fixation off of those things and put them on the glory and comfort and joy of the promised coming and deliverance of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Advent in a nutshell. You think things are bad? Look to Christ. He's coming. He has come and will come again. And His coming brings great comfort and great joy. The gospel can only be appreciated as good news when we know we are hopeless without it. 
It's not good news if everything else is good. It's not good news if cookies and ice cream are just as good, or if bonus, Christmas bonus checks are just as good, or if a vacation is just as good. It's not good news because it speaks of Christmas time when people are supposed to get together and give each other gifts. No, it's good news because we're doomed without it. It's good news because there's no hope without it. And it's good news because as bad as anything can ever seem, whether Assyria or Babylon or are at your doorstep, willing to, ready to decapitate you, whether there's viruses and plagues, whether there is misinformation about everything, whatever the horror, whatever the misery, Christ is your comfort and joy and is your reality and is here and available to you. And that's the message of the prophet Isaiah and indeed of the gospel through the centuries. Comfort, comfort to God's people. For we know that we are hopeless without his comfort. And we can echo what is said in Isaiah later on in, in the book that's at the top of your outline. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has indeed comforted his people and will indeed have mercy on his afflicted. And we, his afflicted, must know that comfort and that peace and that joy. So comfort, comfort, because he has accomplished it all. Here in Isaiah, he speaks of a future day when that accomplishment would be fulfilled. We have an already accomplishment of that in the coming of Christ and the dying on the cross and the declaring of his victory in our understanding that we are saved and that it is finished and that we are part of his kingdom and that we are joined to him. We know the comfort because the war is over and our sin is forgiven. And he has accomplished it all. Historical context here is that Judah's exile would come to an end. But we also understand that our exile here on this earth will come to an end. We understand that everything that is negative, everything that is evil, everything that is wicked has an ending. But for those who are in Christ, the goodness and the glory and the joy is the, it will indeed last. The judgment has come upon God's Son on the cross, and because He took that judgment, and because He paid for the sins, the warfare over that sin is ended. The guilt over that sin is done. The iniquity is pardoned. And you can be comfortable even in our current shame culture. Yes, we are becoming more and more of a shame culture. How dare you not think this way? How dare you not act this way? How dare you not use those words? How dare you not dress this way? How dare you not patri patronize that business? How dare you, how dare you, how dare you? You should be ashamed of yourself. That is the louder and louder cry of our culture every day, a shame culture, which tries to get you to conform to its ideology by shaming you into it and making you afraid of facing people and being yourself. Please understand that God's victory eviscerates that shame. And because there is now no guilt, but our assurance is outside of our own activity and outside of our own self and our assurance is in the Lord, we can know that the war is over. The comfort, is, the, the comfort has come. The sin is forgiven because the victory is the Lord's. And His accomplishment is there. So there's comfort and assurance in that. Comfort, comfort to God's people, because only good things are ahead in Christ. Comfort because of the redemption and sanctification that has been accomplished by His coming and by His atonement and by His victory. The already here is that in Christ, things can be redeemed and made to glorify Him. The already and that only good things are ahead in Christ, is that his power is above and beyond evil. He binds the strong man. And in binding the strong man, he can take everything that has been touched and corrupted by sin and use it for his glory. Every blessing, every aspect of your life that before you knew Christ 
would be used for destruction and evil and for selfishness and for your own blindness, can now be redeemed, unless it is blatant sin, can now be redeemed and used for His glory. That's the beauty and the joy of the comfort of God's gospel. It's active and effective. It works and it changes. It's not stagnant. It's not just justification. We don't say, glory, I'm saved. I will be in heaven someday. Now let me go live my life the same way I was before. No. It's transformative. It takes what I do and what I am and what I like and molds it more into God's image and has influence around us as we go about and do that. What used to be evil may be used for good. Every valley shall be exalted, changed. Every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight. The power and the word of the Lord will do this, is doing it in our lives in the already. Your weakness and your weakest qualities that the world disregards have been purchased by God to be sanctified and used for Him. What you thought was a blemish or an impediment to you, God's power overcomes and changes to be an instrument to advance His kingdom and to glorify Him. That's the wonderful redemption of comforting news. And that's the already. The not yet is that the earth will be made perfect in the fullness of time, that the glorified Christ will reign and will straighten out the hills and valleys and make crooked paths straight. He will bring streams to the desert, and the earth will once again be able to be fully inhabited without poisonous, without poisonous animals and thorns and briars. The joy of the Lord, the comfort of the Lord, the truth of the Lord, the will of the Lord, the power of the Lord will accomplish this. And of course, the comfort is beautiful because we're told in verse 5 that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has indeed spoken it. A spectacle to behold. Again, the not yet. Is that Christian, in, the already, I mean, the already that's here, that's accomplished, that Christ has brought in us and in His church and in His kingdom is that Christian influence when it's biblical has only brought good to this world. Good education is because of Christian influence. Advancement in medicine, by and large, at its heart, is of good Christian influence. Scientific learning and understanding, at its core, at its foundation, is because of good Christian influence. Freedom, representative government, at its core, is because of good Christian influence. When the Bible is applied correctly and objectively, it is only good for a society. And everyone benefits from the testimony of the gospel in this, to this world in some way because of its breadth and because of its scope and because of the way it has been applied through the centuries. We have mucked it up. We, in our selfishness, have given it a bad name and in our sin. But the Word of God and its application objectively applied has only done good, and everyone is party to it in some way. The not yet is that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. The first advent brings in the kingdom to be advanced and to be built up and to be brought forward. The second advent brings in the mouth of the Lord who speaks and rules with his rod of iron in perfect justice and perfect truth and in perfect peace. Comfort, comfort my people and tell them these things and build them up in these things that we may bask in his glory and in his beauty. In verse 6, the voice says, cry out, cry what else? I'm thankful that in this season of the year, the gospel and the message of that gospel becomes slightly more visible. But I also marvel at the ability for human nature and for the deception of the devil to take a message that is meant to bring us out of sin and 
out of materialism and out of the gloom and doom of this world and keep our gaze fixed on Messiah and His coming and eternal salvation, our human nature and the wiles of the devil can take such a beautiful, glorious message and turn it into a commercial holiday. Yes, wonderful that the message of the cross and of the gospel comes out and is heard a little more loudly in this time of year, but it's so buried and choked by business and money and pressure to get the right thing and to have the right thing, by numbers and figures, and by all the things that so beset the non-biblical aspects of Christmas time. And so when the voice says, cry out, and he says, what shall I cry? He says, cry out a reminder that these shallow things are deceptive and fleeting. Cry out a reminder that all flesh is as grass. The material things are nice and certainly can be used for God and certainly can be seen and enjoyed as gifts from God. But they are only like grass and flowers. Here, they serve a purpose. They're beautiful. They're fragrant. But the grass fades, the flower wilts, and all passes away. Cry out, he says. Cry out and remind these people, even though you're comforting them, cry out and remind them that everything is fragile and everything is temporary. And don't get too attached to your stay here. Don't get too attached to what your culture says you need to obsess about. Don't spend too much time on the things that only have precedence in the now. For life is short. The Christmas message brings a warmth, it brings a security, it brings a joy. But the Christmas message also needs to include an aspect of urgency. The urgency that reminds us that life indeed is short. That you are made for more than this. More than health. More than family. More than friends. More than a promotion. More than fame. Make your time here count for eternity. Don't just be grass that fades away and we don't remember what every blade looked like. Don't just be a flower that blurs into a memory of what all flowers seem to look like and we can't remember any specific one. Be someone who lives and has their feet firmly planted in the eternal kingdom and aspect of the glory of God. Live with purpose in Christ. Live with a mission that loves Him and loves neighbor. Live with a splendor that can only come from His hand worship Him in that beauty and in that mission. Live for worship. Live in worship. Don't just see the material things as something that is for you to own and to accumulate and to, and to obsess over, but see them as gifts and as instruments in part of your worshipful existence and movement towards what God would have you be and have you do. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord the word of our God stands forever, and it is only Him who is forever and ever. Comfort and joy is found in what will last, and what lasts forever. The Word, the Logos, Christ the Savior. They're already on news programs and on television programs doing 2020 hindsight reels. Remember the year, and what a year it's been, and the year even started off with some crazy things going on before the pandemic in January and February. I was reminded of that yesterday. The year has been a strange one. And people seem to have this understanding that when the clock strikes midnight and it becomes 2021, that we'll now be in a new year and 2020 will be gone and things will be better. People have created this understanding that it's 2020 that's the problem. There was an article in the paper yesterday about people burning their 2020 calendars as a catharsis to make them feel better. Well, what does that do? That just creates a false notion. I'm not fear-mongering here, but the reality is 
you don't know what 2021 is going to bring. We hope it's going to be better. We hope by God's grace and by God's power, he will be at the center and will bring people to himself and make things more pleasant and more enjoyable. But we don't know. What if things get worse? We don't want to think that way. But we know that it's just as likely that things could get even worse than they could get even better. The reality of a message like this that comes from Isaiah that still applies today is that there is no security in your imaginary hopes. There is no security in the what if. There is only security in what does in fact and indeed stand forever, the Word of God. There is only security in gospel accomplished by Christ forever and ever. There is only security in Him. Though the mountains be removed, though the earth fall into the sea, though catastrophe comes, God lives, God rules, God reigns, God has the victory, God is supreme. And there are good tidings in Christ alone. In verse 9, he now addresses Zion. He now addresses the people of God again. O oh, Zion, you who bring good tidings, Get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Don't be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Lift up your voice and say, behold him. We are a people of the book. Therefore, our, therefore we are a people of good news. We're not a people of complaints. We're not a people of conspiracy theories. We're not a people of what ifs. We're not a people of, oh, woe is me. We're not a people of accusations. We are a people of good tidings in Christ alone, of good news, of joy, of comfort. We are the people that when we go to the gathering, change the subject and bring it to comfort and joy. We are the people that when we influence a person's life, don't leave them with more insecurity, but with less. We are the people who are supposed to bring laughter and smiles to people's faces and a calm, not an agitation. Oh, Zion, you who bring good tidings, testify of this. These things that tell everyone to embrace the Lord your God. Behold him and embrace him, for he defines truth. He defines justice. He defines science and law and reason and logic. He gives purpose and meaning. And indeed, he is your life and your way. Come, let us teach you what he is like. You, O Zion, who bring good tidings and good news, be the teachers you're meant to be. Be the ones who bring the glorious beauty of the cross to people's lives. Verse 10, we're reminded again, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work is before him. His strong rewarding rule is something that really does indeed bring good tidings of comfort and joy. You don't have reason, there's no, there's no reason to have confidence in any earthly government. I know that, you know that. Yet we still yearn for it for some reason. There is no earthly rule in all of history that can ever got, get unprecedented praise. Every government, no matter how good, has elements of wickedness among it because human beings are, are, are involved. But behold, he will rule with a strong hand. He will be the end and purpose. And there will be no bad press in his government because no one will be able to think of anything bad to print. There will be no mockery in late night television because there won't be anything that, any, that could be possibly made fun of. Everyone will be in agreement that this is indeed perfection before us. There will be no editorials that say this is a better way to go. There will just be comfort and joy and peace in the fulfillment of Messiah's rule and reign. And one of the things that 
Isaiah says that we touched on slightly last week is the way that he comforts and provides for his people as well. In verse 11, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Be carried and be fed by his hands. If this is a message that offends you, if this is a message that makes you uncomfortable, then I challenge you to consider where your security and your comfort really lies. Because if being carried by God is too demeaning for you, too uncomfortable for you, then you need to consider why you need to be the one who carries, why you need to be God, why you need to be in control. Why? Just let yourself be carried by Him. Trust and obey. Delight in Him. It's not appealing at first, I know. Our very nature and the way we're wired fights against it. It's not ego boosting, but it is nourishing. It is fulfilling. He will feed you and He will carry you. And in, it will be in perfect governance with acceptance and humility. Christ has come. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And he brings the greatest tidings, the greatest blessings of comfort and joy. Sing, O heavens. Be joyful, O earth. And break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. Let's pray together. Thank you for the good news of comfort and joy. Thank you for the gospel which saves. We pray that it will be applied to us in such a way that we are not affected by the shame culture that surrounds us, that we are not affected by the what-ifs of the future, that we are not affected by the, the, the hard times that, some, that beset us. We know that we are not the first nor the last to deal with these things. The grass withers, the flower fades, but you and your word live forever. May that be our hope and our stay and our trust and our light and our life. May we be a people of good tidings, a people of mission, a people of action, a people of comfort and joy. And may your comfort and joy abound in this church and in all of our hearts. We ask this blessing be poured out in Jesus' name.